Thank you, everyone, for coming to Locate. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, I am actually going to be joined today uh, by three incredible founders and CEOs of three companies that are doing incredible things in the perception space, everything from LiDAR sensing to collecting roadside imagery for the future of autonomous vehicles to fusing together sensor inputs from all different kinds of vehicles and putting it into a way that can actually be used on the road today. Um, so I'd love to go ahead and have um, all three panelists just join me, and then I'll introduce you guys individually. So come on out. Um, we'll be introducing uh, Austin from Luminar, uh, Forrest from DeepScale, and Nikhil from Mapper. So a hand of applause for our panelists today. All right, so I'm going to run down the line and uh, read through quick intros. So all the way here to the uh, audience left is uh, Nikhil. So Nikhil is the CEO and co-founder of Mapper AI. He developed his passion for mapping while working at Carnegie Mellon's Tartan Racing Team that won the DARPA Urban Challenge in 2007. Uh, after DARPA, Nikhil performed research on real-time visual recognition systems at UC Berkeley, earning a PhD in 2013. He honed his expertise in high-precision navigation while working at Bosch Research and subsequently at Flyby Media, which was acquired by Apple in 2015. Uh, Nikhil co-founded Mapper uh, with Flyby colleague Alonso Patron that same year, and today Mapper is growing mapping infrastructure. It's a growing, sorry, growing mapping infrastructure company, creating machine-readable maps at scale for autonomous vehicles. Uh, in the middle, we have Forrest Iandola. Forrest is the CEO and co-founder of DeepScale. He started his career in high-performance computing, accelerating and rethinking computer vision algorithms. He has published more than 20 papers, all of his most recent focused on accelerating and improving deep learning for computer vision. Uh, Forrest also completed a PhD at UC Berkeley where he developed efficient deep neural networks such as SqueezeNet. He co-founded DeepScale with Professor Kurt Koitzer in 2015. Today, DeepScale builds perception software for vehicles that take sensor data from the surrounding area as input and determine where everything is, what everything is called, and how it is all moving. And then finally, we have Austin Russell, who is the co-founder and CEO of Luminar. Uh, Austin began his career at an early age, writing his first patent at age 12. A year later, his interest became focused on the photonics industry, where he later developed a number, uh, a number of projects, ranging from laser-based wireless power transmission to projected AR systems. In 2012, Austin founded Luminar while performing independent research at the Beckman Laser Institute. He was subsequently recruited at Stanford to study in the Applied Physics Department, but dropped out three months later to accept the Teal Fellowship. Since then, the Luminar team has achieved a number of, achieved a number of breakthroughs in LiDAR with a mission to make autonomous vehicles both safe and ubiquitous. Um, I will also add that uh, both Nikhil and Austin have assets here to check out and see working uh, for real. Uh, Austin uh, has the Luminar semi-truck being shown for the first time in California. Uh, out in the parking lot with LiDAR, and then we have a special LiDAR-related surprise at the party later. Uh, and then uh, Mapper AI also has some things to show out here in the exhibition hall. Um, so thank you again. I just want to thank our panelists for, for joining us. I'm really excited to, to dive right into some questions. Before you do that, yeah. uh, uh, you know, finding a company is hard. When I found it, I was this smashing gentleman, and now I <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's not Nikhil, just so everyone knows. <laughs> So anyone questions? <laughs> I, I was surprised when I looked at that. I was like, wait a so minute. So this is Nikhil, just clear this up. Um, that, this is Nikhil. Um, that looks better than this Nikhil. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> On that note. Uh, so the, the first question I wanted to ask the panel, uh, certainly the, the autonomous vehicle buzz has, I think, become pretty full-throated over the past uh, seven or eight years since, since I've been working in this space. And it seems like when I first started, all the announcements were for what it's going to be like in 2020. And now most of the analyst papers I read are talking about what's coming in 2025. And I feel like they just keep pushing the horizon farther and farther out beyond where it's really tangible. Uh, and I really want to pull it in a little bit and talk about what are some things that we're going to see in the next 18 to 24 months. Um, so actually, I'd love to start, uh, Nikhil, with, with some thoughts you might have. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks for organizing the panel. I've been, uh, you know, love the back and forth before we uh, got this going, and really appreciate all of you being here as well. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of the conversations that are punt the, you know, the topics are sort of moving on a, uh, the narrative is moving on a logarithm scale when the uh, technology is being developed on a linear scale. So, um, 
the uh, reality is that, uh, there are a lot of different types of use cases. This is a very fragmented market in logistics, mobility. It's a very fragmented market, and there's so many different ways in which they can be used. And uh, uh, what's really, in my opinion, going to happen over the course of the next uh, uh, 24 months is uh, a more focus on products and use cases, which can be enabled by different, you know, uh, pieces of uh, the technology stack coming together to make it function safely uh, in that particular niche, right? So be it uh, autonomous shuttles around a campus or a pizza delivery vehicle or whatever it may be, right? And uh, I, I think that's where a lot of the focus is now going, uh, and which is great for a developer community as well. Developers get very excited about end users and how they can focus on building out use cases to f uh, facilitate that. And I think those conversations are starting to happen, which I'm very excited about. Awesome. Uh, Forrest, I know you're working on technology that's intended to be used by the automotive industry on a pretty short horizon. Could you tell us some about that? Sure. So I think similar to what Nikhil said, I, I predict that for, for more specific use cases than just drive anywhere, anytime, um, you know, there will be mass rollouts in the next you know, 24 months, or at least larger scale rollouts than just a few development cars in a fleet. And um, one of those rollouts, you know, if you more broadly talk about automated driving that's not necessarily fully autonomous, is making cars that don't hit things. And um, you know, that's an area where there's, there, there's been so, some steps in that direction over the last 15 years. You know, uh, NHTSA, IIHS, and Euro NCAP all um, either currently have or have steps towards testing automatic emergency braking and other kind of basic collision avoidance um, capabilities. But my, my sense is that there's you know, a, a huge range of different opportunities for making cars safer, whether it's fully automated or, or collision avoidance. And I, I think collision avoidance is, is actually just, just ramping up at this stage as a mass market uh, thing and as something that can do more than just mm. slam on the brake sometimes. Awesome. And then Austin, I think you definitely appreciate things that are very immediate because you have the largest object at the show out there in the <laughs> parking lot with your LiDAR attached to it. So can you tell us a little bit more about what, what Luminar is doing with LiDAR today? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So. Uh, re really, at Luminar, uh, for about five years, we developed a lot of the core technology in our sensing system, building something completely from the ground up uh, that could really meet the performance requirements necessary to be able to get uh, and move things from auto just autonomous test vehicles to real-world deployable solutions for both, you know, assisted driving, everything from collision avoidance all the way up through, you know, full autonomy and all the different levels in between. So, uh, w with that. Uh, work from basically the chip level up, making our own lasers, receivers, scanning mechanisms, processing electronics, uh, and you know, scale up the team, built out a production facility, uh, ramp things up. We're about 400 people now or so, um, and continuing to grow on that. Uh, now, now that we have something that sees about you know, 50 times higher resolution, about 10 times farther range, some of the best performing solutions out there, uh, we can actually solve that last 1% of the edge cases that uh, everybody talks about, uh, and be able to go from seeing some things some of the time to all things all the time. Uh, and with that, yeah, uh, now we're getting a chance to be able to do that at, at scale, um, ramp things up, and uh, going beyond the you know, four OEM partners that, that we have today. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting times. But as you're saying, I think th th there's still massive challenges overall in the industry. Uh, this is, uh, but this is hopefully the right, the right start to the problem. Yeah, I think uh, autonomous vehicles are, are very real for a lot of people uh, today more than ever, just because they're operating in so many different cities and pretty much every continent now as well. Uh, but it's an extremely complicated area, even if you just break it down to the perception piece, because within perception, you have uh, radar systems. And on this panel, we have people that have experience working with radar systems, LIDAR systems, traditional vision systems, both uh, also within the infrared domain for LIDAR as well as cameras. And then there's GPS, IMU. It gets broken down really quickly, especially when you try to try to talk about performance and find a lingua franca for what, it, like how well does the system perform within the context of its use case. So this is a really tough problem. I would love to hear some insight from the panel about what are the right metrics for gauging the performance of an autonomous vehicle system for safety, for performance, for time. Do you want me to start? Sure. Okay. So um, I guess first of all, let's let's um, let's look at the word performance itself. So. Uh, at least in, in, the, in the space of machine learning and deep learning, performance often by default means accuracy. But I think there's actually a broader range of things that you need to consider, um, like robustness. So, so accuracy is how well can I do on some test set? 
in some testing environment, but you can make that test set really easy. So robustness is the counter to that to, to make sure you're, you're choosing challenging scenarios. Then you've got more system level metrics in terms of things like, um, you know, how much energy am I using? How much hardware do I need? What kind of frame rate and real, you know, how real time is it with respect to my different sensors and, and latencies? So those are all very important to look at at the individual module level. Um, when you look at the complete system, you know, the, the most important things are, you know, is it, is it driving safely? Is it hitting things? And so some people look at things like, you know, how often in a, a fully automated prototype vehicle is, is the human disengaging? That's a, an interesting but very, very coarse metric. You don't get a lot of detail from that. So, you know, breaking it down into, um, you know, in, in individual types of scenarios, you know, what, what kind of error rates do we have where, where there's a misunderstanding about the environment or an incorrect action that's unsafe is taken. Um, so now I'm off in the direction of, of metrics that are not so clearly defined as how much power am I using or how many false positives are there. And I'm going more in the direction of, okay, so um, if, we, if we look at, at the general case of highway driving with, without exits, right, we start to think about metrics like how well can I understand the time to impact the vehicle in front of me? Um, if you look at city driving that's more chaotic and you've got pedestrians everywhere, maybe the, the, the interesting metric becomes, you know, how often do I, do I you know, note a, a pedestrian in my path that I could actually collide with or that's heading into my path um, and make a mistake in terms of a false positive or a false negative? So um, I think there are definitely surface level metrics that you can put in a PowerPoint slide that people will understand, like disengagements or how much power are you using or a very overall, you know, what's your, what's your precision and recall? But, you know, you, you really have to dive into the details and work back from the end application to do, to do really holistic um, benchmarking. To, to sort of build upon that a little bit, uh, Nikhil, how did you go through the, the process of finding the right kinds of cameras to use for your application? Like, what kind of specifications were you looking for? A great question. Uh, so again, go, uh, just to sort of build up on what uh, Forrest was saying there, I, I completely agree with you that there, you know, the industry is currently in a development phase and is going to enter a production phase uh, sometime in the next n years. Uh, and the type of metrics that are being used today are development metrics. Uh, disengagement is a great proxy for sort of subsuming a whole bunch of things, and you know, uh, disengagement is right, we don't know what happened, something went wrong, right? Uh, and then production metrics are kind of like you know coming closer to like the Six Sigma type metrics. How, you know, how do you bring it into uh, sort of a workflow? How do you actually measure it in a manner that uh, uh, improves processes and things like that? And so uh, the reason I talk about that is. Um, when, when, uh, as a mapping company, uh, we see ourselves sort of uh, uh, unbundling this critical layer in order to help in the development phase and be available for the production phase sooner, right? If cars are going to be out on the road, they need to have maps ahead of time. They need to have LIDARs ahead of time. They need to have perception systems. All these unbundle, and they need to be available prior to that production, right? So that said, um, uh, the, the, the important question for us is, uh, yes, there is a development phase right now, but the production phase is going to happen sooner. Uh, that's, that's what we're betting. And so we choose our sensors and hardware and even the software choices we make uh, are essentially in there to act as that connective tissue that can uh, work in the current development phase of the industry so that we can uh, help uh, with all the different use cases in little pockets where uh, uh, testing is happening, and then help in that transition to the production phase as well as that scale up starts happening mm -hmm. right so that that's kind of the uh, th that's the north star metric that we use to sort of uh, choose our uh, uh, sort of sp specific internal uh, metrics for different uh, aspects of the system mm -hmm. yeah and, and even when talking about perception metrics and other things i mean there's a lot of stuff that uh, to build off your guys points like it's totally not established uh, by by any means it's it's interesting to see that uh, really, as, as people start to develop their programs, they're just trying to get it so that, you know, start out, like, follow a couple lines on a road, then, you know, evolve from there, as you said, try to not hit things. Um, but then what, as you start to think about you know, real-world deployments and going beyond just a, a good demo, uh, the, the kinds of disengagement rates that you're talking about and the false positive, false negative rates from, from a perception standpoint are orders of magnitude different than what they are even in some of the best programs out there today. Uh, so w with that, um, you know, we're certainly going to be able to establish uh, some type of gold standard for, for various parts of the stack, that they, like tests that you can actually be able to meet. 
um, you know, in addition to end-to-end -end, you know, type uh, safety metrics in the safety case, uh, as that's something that's that's well understood and recognized. So, um, and really, like that, that's you know, with with Luminar, that's kind of what what we're building here in the first place. Is like I said, it's all about uh, solving those extra nines uh, on the on the end of the problem. It's easy to get something that works most of the time, uh, but with that, it's you know, it's like you know, how do you see an like an object, you know, 200 meters on the road, like a tire or uh, a black car, which are notoriously difficult to see with with lidar systems, or you know, that um, the kid that runs out in the street chasing after a ball. It's those types of things that, uh, that you have to see really well. One of the really interesting things about the the automotive industry within Silicon Valley is. Uh, it's very different, difficult to, to reconcile the five or six year development cycle of the automotive industry with the traditional, or not traditional at all, but like the contemporary like scrum based or like very quick rev cycles. Uh, how, I think one thing I've, I've run into a lot is um, it's, it's really difficult for sort of the, the establishment of an industry with a tremendous amount of inertia to deal with how different a, a software-oriented culture works, and you, you can't beta test airbags. Uh, so what does it actually take to get from prototype to production for some of the applications that you guys are working on? All right, I'll take it. Everyone's sure. looking at me. It's in there. Um, with what we're building, uh, uh, you know, maps are, uh, you know, I, Austin says something really interesting, that the sensors they're building see all the world all the time instead of some of the world some of the time. Uh, mapping is sort of, uh, slightly different uh, in, in that it is an offline process as it is today. In the future, it could become more online. But right now, uh, the, uh, uh, the way the infrastructure is set up is, is done offline. And the kinds of things that we think a lot about over here are, are uh, you're absolutely right. You cannot have those long five-year cycles. You cannot just take what applies in technology companies and then expand it out. Right? You can't have annualized OKR meetings. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Uh, um, and uh, so the way we approach this is we think about uh, maps as something that needs to hit a quality threshold because they act as a ground truth. Uh, uh, there are certain cases where, uh, you know, the accuracy of the map is extremely, extremely important, right? Uh, but in certain cases, it's okay if it's not so great. Uh, a great example is if you have, you know, within our maps, we build these HD maps with the different semantic layers that include the lanes, the curves, the traffic controls, and the association between all of these elements. Um, if, if the lanes are, you know, five centimeters away from where it actually is uh, being seen from a perception system, that's okay. But the problem is if, let's say, during the annotation process or a verification process, somebody fell asleep at their mouse pointer and dragged the lane through somebody's house, right? Now, that's a problem. Uh, so that's a really gross uh, error. Uh, and then there are all these little fine uh, things like traffic lights being associated with the wrong lane that, that can cause a disaster. So uh, having the processes that will quickly iterate to start checking these kinds of errors and bringing it into a, a process of verification and correction is uh, important. So that's the way we think about uh, our development cycles as well, to be as fast as to uh, fix these in a measurable manner. Right? So that's our uh, internal metrics that we use. Yeah. Can I chime in on that? So yeah. yeah, so I think there are two core questions here. The, the, and the high level one is how do you get into mass production as a startup? In, in the automotive industry. <laughs> One question is, how do we figure out how to navigate the getting designed into a car thing in a reasonable amount of time? And with, for that, I mean, um, the, the biggest thing for us has been, has been bringing someone on board who's done it before, right? So, so we brought in an automotive business development expert who has, has done $100 million a year plus in, in selling chips and hardware into the auto industry. Um, getting in the design cycle sometimes at the beginning, but sometimes once the car is already, already partway designed, right, to shorten that up. So that's, that's really more about, I think, understanding the, the people and the politics and the sensibility to the customer rather than some, some sort of technical insight. Um, I guess one thing to add, though, is, is when we're doing pure software, you know, software is one of the last things to get finalized, usually. Usually the hardware architecture is decided much earlier in the design cycle, so that helps us quite a bit. Then the other question, when we say, how do you get into mass production in cars as a startup, is how do you meet the rigorous quality requirements, right? I mean, cars are much more safety critical than applications that uh, just run on a smartphone or on a desktop that aren't interacting with the outside world and, 
and actuating a robot that weighs thousands of pounds. So um, I've, I've found, heard the following story over and over again. Um, you know, someone who works at an OEM or, or an automotive supplier, you know, looks at what's currently available in the automotive supply chain in terms of perception, particularly based on cameras and, and radar. LiDAR has barely made it into mass production yet. I think that's changing. Um, but they take, you know, take a look at the, the, what's available from the automotive supply chain, and, and none of it really has made the jump over to using deep neural nets, not, even, not for control, but not, I'm not even talking about control, but just for perceiving the, the environment. And over the last five or six years, deep neural nets have completely changed uh, how we do um, vision and perception tasks. I mean, there's been order of magnitude improvement in, in error rates on a lot of these tasks due to deep learning. I think deep learning has has caused more improvements to vision and perception than the previous 40 years, probably, at least on some tasks, right, you know, we're able to achieve. Um, so, you know, as a result, the punchline is, I, I hear stories all the time of people who work at an OEM or a tier one, they downloaded some deep neural net off a graduate student's website, maybe from Stanford or from Berkeley. <laughs> it actually does all kinds of things that the automotive supply chain, you know, kind of solutions can't do yet. And so, then the next question is, okay, but, um, the automakers are going, we'd like to use deep neural nets in mass-produced vehicles as, as part of the perception for collision avoidance, but um, how do we get, get to the point where rather than using multiple full-size GPUs for that, uh, we actually can run on, on you know, a $20 processor that you get from an automotive chip company, you know, ARM-based, you know, kind of very low cost, high reliability. Um, and it just turns out that, that our, our team, you know, dating back to our time as, as graduate students at Berkeley, were doing, you know, very efficient deep neural nets before before the community had really picked up on that being an important problem. So, so you know, we got this this big head start in that area. So, so that all adds up to, yeah. I mean, if you have the right angle as a, as a Silicon Valley company, there are totally opportunities to get into mass-produced cars uh, fairly quickly. And then Austin, the, I kind of feel like autonomous vehicles is kind of a microcosm within auto that's getting larger and larger every day, but there's also an emerging microcosm within that of the LiDAR space with its own unique set of challenges. Yep. And that, that is just a, a Herculean undertaking just to get a sensor that's robust, let alone can they maintain high levels of performance in all different weather conditions. Can you talk about some of the challenges you face at Luminar? Yeah, I, I absolutely. So, and I, I think this this all ties into together to building something that can actually be deployed on on real cars in series production. So, you know, r really for us from the s we had to take into account all of these different key product requirements from the start. I think uh, one nice thing about developing software is that you're able to make some level of uh, to some extent, some tweaks on on the fly or later on with this is that we we had to you had to build something with the right architecture from day one, um, and we, you're investing like years, like tens of hundreds of millions of dollars and like hundreds of people's time in, into this. And uh, I think there's there's really uh, 14 different key product requirements that you have to be able to take into account when building out a LiDAR system. Oh my God, please list them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so so there's 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 a performance, there's the kind of, you can put the these in three different categories. There's, there's performance, there's scalability, and then there's uh, cost side of things. So. Uh, performance, you have to be able to see out, uh, out to 250 meters, not just perfectly bright white reflective objects, but dark objects, meaning like you know, 5 to 10% reflectivity. Uh, resolution, you have to be able to see millions of points out in the environment and enough and focus them to a point of where you can make out not just if there's something out there and what it is, but uh, or where it is, but what it is with those many nines worth of reliability and accuracy on all those three uh, sides. You have to have a fast frame rate, more than 10 frames per second. Wide field of view uh, has to be able to work in rain, fog, and snow and in inclement weather conditions. You can't interfere with its other sensors of its type, can't interfere with sunlight, all the while having a highly scalable solution that you can make millions of units for with a secured supply chain with the right exclusivity contract for manufacturing and in house uh, production facility uh, where with and have made relevant acquisitions. I'll Aren't these uh, just facts about Luminar? Or <laughs> <is that like>? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, Take I'll, notes, <laughs> folks. That's yeah. yeah. how you start a billion-dollar lidar company. Exactly. It's it's it's, it's uh, this is this is this is hard stuff. Like. Um, you know, and then you still have to meet all those auto grade requirements, like huge temperature ranges, shock and vibe requirements, um, you know, and like be able to meet Department of Commerce standards, uh, basically FDA standards for eye safety. You know, not to mention all the other like ASOL standards on the on the auto side, and still make something at low cost. And if you miss a single one of those things that I just said, you don't have a product. So. Um, but yes, we, d we did take those into account from the start <laughs> as like building LiDAR company 101, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but the reality is, is that 
th th this stuff is is not trivial, and to be able to get all of those those things that, that I just mentioned, um, this this is not something that you can cobble together with off-the-shelf parts. This is not something that you can build in a year or two. Uh, this is something that requires an incredible amount of of intense effort. You know, there's only so many elements on the periodic table that you can work with, but uh, you have to do the right ones, the right ways, fab your own materials and other stuff, and that's that's what we spent the time doing to to ensure that this is something that can go beyond these test fleets to volume production. That's that's why the automakers that, that we're partnered with today um, you know, have, have invested a, a lot in us. And now that you can go, because like I said, it's, performance is the number one, like first step, like get your passenger from point A to point B alive, uh, which no one can actually do yet, by the way. But all the while, you, you, you have to uh, you have to be able to take into account everything else too. So that's why I'm saying like, to say the problem is just hard is, is an understatement. And, but we'd like to think that we're on the right track. Yeah, my, uh, my first boss, my first job in the automotive industry told me that automotive is a long, slow donkey ride through hell. Um, <laughs> and that's sort of framing a bit for sort of a more macro question just about the space. You, you all have tons of relevant expertise in, in fields that have applications that are very, very wide. Um, but what, what made you choose automotive as a place to apply those? Um, we'd love to hear. Sure, yeah. Um, the for the uh, amount of uh, uh, investment of time uh, here, the uh, you know we, we want a path to market that is sooner as a company, right? To uh, uh, you know, so as a mapping company for us, we, we think about all the different possible use cases, and we got excited about uh, the automotive sector because we felt like that's one place where we can actually, with our uh, uh, effort contribute and create a product that uh, can benefit people's lives. Uh, there, there are safety issues. There are all these issues that come in over here. And being able to uh, create something that uh, has a near-term uh, uh, market that is uh, 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 you know, not only a huge market from a uh, dollars and cents perspective, but also has a, a huge impact on people's lives is uh, very, very meaningful. Logistics is one of those things that um, you know, if you really look at any single uh, um, uh, part of the world, right? Logistics is what you, you need. Logistics to either get things or to uh, you know ship things out to uh, stimulate the local economy and to create a civilization. So uh, it, it's a very clear uh, a reason to invest time, and that's what got uh, us excited on doing maps for. Uh, the, the sector first. Uh, that said, there are a whole bunch of other uh, use cases as well, and I think those will just start uh, developing over time. Uh, who would have thought that augmented reality would have been would become a big market ten years ago? It was still niche in within university campuses, and now uh, there are actually people walking around. Uh, you know, using their phones for different types of uh, use cases. So uh, the, uh, automotive for us is like the one that we see as the uh, nearest market that has the highest impact. For, for me, a big part of it is actually passion. So I grew up totally loving cars. Uh, got my first go-kart when I was seven. Got my first motorcycle when I was about 12. Rode around a little farm in rural Illinois. And uh, when I got to college, you know, I thought what I wanted to do was to go, go do something in, in automotive. Um, I thought mechanical engineering was, was the degree for me. Got to my first job fair, and, and really the most interesting things I could find to do were, you know, designing door handles or settling, setting the idler controller software on a cargo van. And, and it, you know, automotive is a very hierarchical area. Um, takes a while to get ahead, at least traditionally. And at University of Illinois, where I was, where they just built this, this you know, Tom Siebel uh, had just, just paid to build this, this city block size, all glass computer science building. I went, I already kind of know how to program, and I think that's actually where the money is. So <laughs> went that direction, um, got into machine learning, also mostly out of passion, uh, went to grad school at, at Berkeley, and, and by 2013, machine learning for me had mostly become deep learning. And coming out the end of that, you know, you know, finishing up my PhD at Berkeley, I was looking at different opportunities, and, and automotive basically fell into our laps. And it's just completely kind of mind-boggling to me that, you know, the, the thing that I just kind of, by a somewhat random walk, ended up working on in grad school ended up being probably one of the most important key enabling technologies to the next generation of vehicles on the road. Uh, so, so I didn't predict that at all, but, but here I am, and I'm really glad to be able to contribute something to, to these cars that I think are really cool. Yep. So uh, I, I guess for me and um, for, for 
pretty much everyone else at Luminar. It was a, a straightforward combination of both ethics and economics that, that really inspire us to, to work in this industry every day. So uh, I, I'd say for, for, from the start uh, for us, y six years ago, uh, as you can imagine, the, the autonomous vehicle space looked very different than, than what it does today. It was, it was quite nascent um, with a very like relatively little interest. I mean, um, but the, the, these are the days when you still had like the only actual program was maybe Google's when you still had angry shareholders writing letters saying they should shut it down. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, this is, so it, it, it was kind of interesting um, seeing the, the, the LiDAR technology that we were developing, we had an opportunity to go into a bunch of other industry verticals, but uh, really wanted to maintain the, the sole focus on the autonomous vehicle space. Um, because uh, for one thing, so you, you take a look at the economics behind it. Yeah, sure, there's a lot of other like billion dollar industries uh, six years ago and today for that matter for, for LiDAR. Uh, but th this is, we're talking like a multi trillion dollar industry, like a seven trillion dollar global mobility. I mean, ar ar arguably in many respects, the largest industry in the world and largest impact, you know, potentially in the world. Um, but, uh, you know, when you talk about impact uh, ethically and philosophically, I mean, I mean, we, we all know the statistics of the, the 1.3 million lives that we lose on the road every year globally. Uh, just, just to think of that, I mean, th like if you really take that into account, really think about it, I mean, that's the entire population of San Francisco and Oakland combined, effectively just being wiped off the face of the map every year. Uh, not to mention the tens of millions of people that are seriously injured also. Uh, and to think that we have an opportunity to actually change that and be able to have that, be able to make safer systems at the end of the day that not just one day can exceed that human level safety, but, you know, orders of magnitude beyond that. That's, that's I think, what, what inspires us to be able to start this. And yeah, it's, this, is, this is not something that you have quick turnaround times. I mean, you talk, as I said, it's normally like seven year design cycles uh, for, for this space. Uh, I mean, automakers are really constraining it down to, I mean, I even just cramming it to try to just a few now <laughs> and trying to do that, which is, which is interesting to see. But, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it really, uh, it really is kind of that, that slow donkey ride through hell as you, as you were saying, but, uh, I, I think it's totally worth it at the end of the day. It's incredibly rewarding to be able to make an impact in such a big space. So all three of you work on, on programs and, and systems and sensors that consume incredible amounts of data, uh, from a whole bunch of different modes, everything from radar to LIDAR to cameras, GPS, infrared. What, what do you see as the value of, like, for example, a mile of data collected? Like, what, first of all, what, what modalities are we talking about? What do you do with this data, and why is this important to you and the way you guys operate? Where is the mile? Is it Sand Hill Road? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> um, I, I, and, and that's a really good question. Uh, kind of what, what is the uh, return on data investment uh, for every mile, and does it marginally sort of start tending towards not useful at some point. Uh, not, for, not in our case, right? not in the mapping case, because every mile is different uh, and should be captured. Uh, it might look similar. Uh, there is a 99% you know, probability that one stretch of uh, a highway in the middle of the country looks very similar to another stretch of the highway. But uh, uh, the way we see it is every single mile needs to be mapped. There are 40 to 50 million miles of road around the world. right? Uh, just in the U.S., there are um, uh, over 2.5 million miles of paved road and uh, uh, close to 200,000 miles of freeway. And all of these uh, are uh, different in that not having the map can uh, actually disable a the functionality there. Right? So we see it as every mile is equally important. Uh, uh, but uh, then again, uh, it depends on you know, what the use case is and why, right? So uh, when, when you're developing these capabilities, having, uh, 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 focusing, uh, this, this is the way I like to think of it, uh, start off where your core competencies are best, right, as a company, as a, if you're trying to build something. If you're trying to build something for college campuses, then pick that mile of, the co of a college campus where you can actually show that it works in a safe manner. Don't pick the hardest problem first. There's, you, you know, they, this, uh, you, you can definitely get there. So that's the way we think about it. Uh, uh, so our view of uh, miles and uh, you know, is in association with maps, not so much from a point of view of it being uh, a training data for uh, something else. That's sort of their uh, specialty. Yeah, great segue. Yeah, miles for us equal, uh, at least with, with appropriate annotation and curation, equal training data, right? And for us, I think actually um, optimizing more for a diverse data set is more important than, than sheer volume. 
although if you want to get as many corner cases in as possible, you are going to have a giant data set. No, no, no surprises there. So you know, driving up and down one-on-one -on -one a zillion times when nothing interesting has happened is, is way less useful than, than maybe a tenth of that amount of data, but where it's, uh, it's in the snow, it's, it's on a twisty mountain pass with poorly marked lanes, there are vehicles behaving erratically, there are vehicle types that we don't see very often and object types we don't see very often. So really seeking out those, those unusual um, um, objects and behaviors uh, is actually, I think, uh, more <coughs> critical than, than you know, sheer volume of data, although both are actually pretty important. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we would certainly say that, I mean, it, it is kind of funny trying to see different, different companies, like, compared how many miles they've driven, like, a, autonomously com compared to one another. I mean, I is the reality is, like, not all miles are created equal by any means or stretch of the imagination there. Um, the, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, honestly, e even when people do collect, you know, a lo lots of data, um, from, from everything that, that, that we've seen, the, frankly, the vast majority of what's collected is actually not useful or potentially even completely useless towards what the end goal is. Like, it depends on what, what, what you're developing for. Like, is it for a demo? Is it for trying to get, like, a real-world deployment, as we were talking about? Um, but uh, it, it all starts with the right data, you know, like, at the end of the day, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. Like great data leads to great autonomous driving, bad data leads to bad autonomous driving. So you have to start with with a, a, the best baseline there uh, in order to be able to yeah, achieve those perception metrics that we were talking about earlier. Get a, you know get achieve that safer than human level capability in in, in any reasonable time frame, and that's a um, that's that's a, that's a non-trivial problem. So I'd say that w it, it's it's less about needing more data, it's about needing more of the right data collected with the right sensing systems, with the right, uh, you know, basically perception and right. infrastructure there. Can I just throw one thing in? You, you mentioned yeah. the, the right data, the right sensing systems. Data is actually more disposable than you might think. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes you might collect a very diverse data set in terms of not just what you're uh, sensing, but also uh, what different sensors you use. But at least for the final mass-produced solution, you know, the final training that you do will probably be on a very specific sensor set that you're deploying. Maybe there's been some pre-training in a broader array, but, um, but what that all adds up to is when people quote, hey, we, we have, you know, we're, we're such and such company, we've been doing autonomous driving for this many years, or autonomous driving research for this many years, here's how many miles our autonomous cars have driven, it's like, yeah, but you're on version mm -hmm. 10 now, and you're yeah, counting exactly. version 1 potentially in, into that number. So um, that's just one more way, and I think, in, in which the number of miles driven metric gets sort of abused and misunderstood. Yeah, and, I, I, and on top of that, I, I really do think people very much underappreciate the dependencies that are built, you know, within an autonomous vehicle stack on top of each other. Um, like the same thing with, with, as you're saying, different versions or different sensors or other things. Like one does not just swap out their sensor in their autonomous vehicle and have everything just work perfectly with the, with the rest of the software. It's, uh, yeah, there, there is a real stickiness to yeah, the product. Exactly. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a huge amount of stickiness. And that's why it's just so critical to be able to get designed in earlier, which is why I think that you know, even this overall market is going to be trending more towards winner take all than you know, 60 different companies you know, try, vying for you know, different, different programs. Um, and, and as a result, uh, Th that's something that is is critical that you get you get right uh, early and you know, get in these programs because even with some of our partners you know we've seen them have to effectively throw out like all of the data that they've collected up to this point uh, you know and just completely start from scratch in that respect and like don't get me wrong like they still have a great team they have like some, some great infrastructure and other things but at, at the same time it's uh, there's like I said there's a lot of stickiness and getting that right platform from the start is is critical. There's data and then there's information, right? Yeah. At some point, <laughs> data becomes cheap, commoditized, uh, noise. easy to get, could even it's be noise. Yeah. Uh, but the information, like how do you maximize the quality of that information, uh, is really the name of the game. And that's why, you know, tossing out a whole bunch of uh, data uh, makes sense. Uh, start, yeah. start from scratch. So. so inherently in the space of autonomous vehicles, and we're trying to replace the human with a bunch of sensors and compute and decision-making capabilities, there's countless comparisons of how well computers can drive versus humans, and usually these are very narrow use cases where you're comparing driving on a straight highway with great lane markings in the sun in California, probably next to Sand Hill Road, uh, to how a computer can do it and how a human can do it. 
Um, we've talked a little bit about metrics that are important for sensors, but usually the comparison isn't between different sensors. It's how safe can the system be compared to how humans perform today. Uh, so thinking about metrics beyond sensors and just for more holistically about the experience of having an automated or autonomous vehicle, how do you gauge how well an autonomous system composed of sensors and a perception system is performing compared to the general public? Because I think one thing that's very interesting is when we have uh, incidents that occur where someone is injured or killed uh, by a vehicle uh, in, in very recent memory by people using automated features or autonomous vehicles, how do you uh, reconcile, like if, uh, if in the United States, for example, 40,000 people are killed every year uh, from, uh, from vehicle accidents, most of these are caused by human error, uh, and th we've just become used to this as a society. I think something probably similar happened when cars started going the roads, the first couple people were killed by automobiles. Uh, but today, if even one person is killed by an automated feature or an autonomous vehicle, then the outrage is deafening. Uh, but even, even if we made autonomous vehicles you know, a thousand times safer, that's still hundreds of people uh, every year around the world that would be killed by them. Like, How do we make this acceptable? What are the right metrics to convince people that we're getting, heading in the right direction and these investments will pay off with a long tail? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd say that, you know, to be honest, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, like everybody would love, you know, 2x safer than human, 10x safer than human, 100x safer than humans. Like, let's just try to get something that's like just human level to start off with, because that, that'd be nice. Because, like I'm saying, when I, I think you know, to be honest, p people are rightfully outraged when we have autonomous test vehicles today that have like human backup drivers as supervisors getting into you know, the backup driver accidents. has a backup driver, right? right? Exactly, yeah. and even with the backup backup drivers, <laughs> still getting into serious <laughs> accidents or even causing deaths. Like the the, the we, we, we need to be getting to a point where that's, that's, that's not the case. But um, the, the other thing is, is that when we talk about failures you know, uh, and like critical failures for these programs, I mean, like I say, even, even some of the top programs, uh, we're talking like, you know, critical failures every, you know, like instances every hundreds of miles, maybe thousands of miles for this. Um, the reality is that we're going to need, th this critical failure rate is going to need to evolve to millions of miles, you know, before we can actually be able to get these out on the road. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting is that um, like say, people try to make comparisons between the two when they truly are orders of magnitude off today. But, you know, it's also it's something, it's something interesting that I noticed is that while humans do get into accidents quite often, uh, people are actually pretty good at not killing themselves in general in such accidents. Like the severity of such is generally not that not that big, like you might get into a, like a little fender bender, you know, in a, in a parking lot. Uh, whereas with a lot of autonomous vehicles, you know, when you have a, a serious failure, you know, you could end up uh, you know, flipping your car on a freeway or like plowing through a farmer's market, you know, uh, which can be much more severe. So yeah. uh, you have to you have to meet the safety si cases for uh, you know small problems, medium problems, and big failure modes, and that's 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 what's really hard. If you think about uh, it, right? Uh, if you go 100 years back, uh, I, I almost feel like autonomous people think about autonomous vehicles like they think about horses, right? Like if it was a horse-driven carriage, if a horse a driven carriage came close to another horse-driven carriage, even if the driver had fallen asleep, the horse will swerve because it doesn't want to hurt itself, doesn't want to go over the cliff. That was like the early debate before cars were human controlled. The uh, horse and buggy uh, salesman said, that'll never happen. Horses are naturally intelligent to, uh, uh, you know, uh, for self-prevalence. And so uh, I almost feel like a, a new definition of horsepower needs to come about over here for uh, 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 autonomous driving. Uh, so it's really a, a, a question of, uh, yes, we compare human drivers to autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, but uh, I, I think kind of like w w what you were talking about, the, the, the evaluate, we, we cannot wait for a long period of time and say, oh, look, the statistics are getting better. People are not dying. There's just general concern that, oh, now you're handing reins back to something that's kind of like an augmented horse that's taking over. So uh, when does the society really feel comfortable with that? And I think uh, the different ways to approach it. Uh, my, my thought process over here is it really begins with uh, uh, provably safe in small controlled environments, get, the co get people comfortable with it. It's, it's, it's really, you know, you're putting your life on the line, so. Right, so the full autonomy case has been well represented by these two, so let me go into driver assistance for, for 15 seconds here. So in driver assistance land, I mean, I commute up and down Highway 101 you know, every morning, a few miles, right? And I, I, I pretty much see the exact same mistake every morning where someone has been looking at their cell phone and rear-ended somebody and then the highway is blocked and, and that person may have been injured, the cars got to get dragged down the road. That's like one of the most preventable 
things, and in, in fact, you know, at least at least uh, rudimentary capabilities in cars to avoid some of these already can be purchased from a car dealer. I think evolving that to avoid, you know, kind of take care of the low-hanging fruit of things that humans get wrong all the time um, is, is a really obvious thing that we actually can gauge how well we're doing pretty easily. Right. Yeah, the, the way to get 10x safer than human right now is to try to... Try to not keep humans out of trouble. To, yeah, yeah, try <laughs> to keep, keep humans out of trouble, exactly, and, and not try to do level five drive everywhere in every scenario. Cool. Well, we're just about at time, but I did, I did want to ask one last question, just closing thought from each of you. Like, what is... This sort of hits back to the very beginning of our talk where we talked about things that are really tangible and, and sensing immediacy. So I would love to hear um, from each of you, like, what's one bold prediction you have for the autonomous vehicle or the perception space for 2020? Uh, maybe starting with Nikhil, go ahead. Sure. Uh, we, we kind of discussed this briefly. I didn't have an answer as soon as you asked me that question before, but I thought about it. And I think what would be really cool is an autonomous uh, service to go back and forth from Tahoe from the Bay Area. I think that would be my prediction for 2020, an autonomous nice. key taxi service. Cool. I think someone will have, some city in the US will have created hands-free driving lanes uh, with, with some asterisks and caveats on that. Um, well, if you're, if you're asking for a bold prediction for 2020, I mean, I, I'd say that I still don't think there will be any truly autonomous vehicle on the road by, by, by that point. Um, you know, and even the safety driver is still kind of L3, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah well, well e even, even that's questionable if people are called, like, even what people call L3 is still questionable. Like, I think there's a lot of level inflation going on, you know, <laughs> within the, uh, <laughs> the industry. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's, you got to separate it out in two different modes, driver in the loop, driver out of the loop. Um, you know, does it require a backup driver constantly looking over the wheel, ready to take over at any given moment? Um, or is it safer than human? Uh, I'd say that the, the latter, uh, which is true autonomy, um, would not happen yet. Uh, I'd say that maybe we even, start even for very constrained, like just go around the airport or something, or maybe go, maybe maybe like going around the airport on private. I, I would say for uh, for public roads in any type of reasonable condition uh, that can operate um, in a commercially viable manner. Uh, I, yeah, I'd, I'd say that that would be the case, or like you know, if you if if you still have to operate if it starts like raining outside, for example, uh, you know, and not not not. So that's what I'm saying. Commercially viable. Yeah, you, you can level inflation has gotten to the point where a level four car could be level four anywhere inside this room, and, and that, yeah. that, that's the yeah. that's the constraint. I mean, right, right now, yeah. you, you could have three remote drivers just like remote controlling mm -hmm. the vehicle yeah. with some like joysticks, like and outsourcing that now, and it's like yeah, can between you do that? geofencing and and teleops, you can kind of yeah. you know. Is that so something that uh, right. limps its way into the spec of <laughs> definition of level yeah, exactly. highly elastic problem space? Yeah, um, exactly. We're definitely at time. I just first want to please join me in thanking our three panelists for an awesome discussion today. Thank you so much.